Uh, he hello. Um, we can't see the audience, but I'm going to start now and introduce, um, well, maybe, yeah, we're at O2, so I think it's okay to start and uh, say welcome. Um, I'm Yara Rodriguez Fowler, and I'm here with Mona Arshi and Sammy Wright, and I'm really, really excited to welcome you to this session, which is called Where We Come From, um, How Do the Stories of Our Childhood Impact Who We Become? Um, before I get into their wonderful books, I'm going to do a little housekeeping and tell you about Paisley Book Festival. Um, so it's now in its third year and was developed as part of Future Paisley, which is a radical and wide ranging program of events, activity and investment using the town's unique and internationally significant cultural story to transform its future. Um, the, since 2022 is the year of Scotland's stories. The theme of this year's festival is Stories Mac Us. I'm sorry if I'm butchering the pronunciation. Um, and we're asking authors and audiences to reflect on the transformational power of stories in our lives and how they shape and reshape our identities and offer us support through difficult times. The festival's being done in a hybrid format, so some events are live in Paisley, while others like this one are streaming digi digitally um, on our YouTube channel. Um, and recordings of the live events will be uploaded to this channel too, and all the digital content is free to access, uh, which we love to see. So, um, first of all, um, so I'm going to introduce both of you. I know that's always the cringiest bit. Um, and I'll say a little bit about your books and why I'm so excited that we're getting to talk to them, talk about them together today. Um, and then we'll do some readings. Uh, we'll have a conversation and then we can do towards the end some questions from the audience. So um, if you're watching and you have a burning question or a question like comes into your mind while we're speaking, um, please put it in the chat and um, we will answer it at the end, towards the end of the session. Okay, so um, uh, this is Mona Arshi's book, Somebody Loves You. Um, Mona Arshi was born in West London, where she still lives. She worked as a human rights lawyer with the advocacy group Liberty for a decade before receiving a master's in creative writing from the University of East Anglia. Her debut poetry collection, Small Hands, was published in 2015, winning the Forward Prize for Best First Collection, and her work has since appeared in the Sunday Times, The Guardian, and The Times of India, as well as on the London Underground. Mona Arshi is a regular contributor to BBC Radio 4. Um, and obviously we're going to be talking about Mona's uh, novel today, but if you haven't read her poetry, you definitely should. It's very, very beautiful and quite piercing when you read it. Um, I'm a huge fan. Uh, and we've got also Sammy Wright. This is his book, Fit. Um, Sammy Wright is a teacher. He was brought up in Edinburgh, worked in London for 12 years, and now lives in Newcastle. He is a member of the Social Mobility Commission and is currently vice principal of a large secondary school in Sunderland. His short stories have been published in a variety of anthologies and his novel Fit, which won the 2020 Northern Book Prize, is his first book-length publication. Um, so I'll give a little bit of background about both books. And um, I'm also wondering if people uh, who are watching this, if you've read the books, I'd love to know. Um, and if you haven't, I'd love to know, because it's interesting to have an idea of... Um, how familiar you are with what we're about to talk about and how much explaining and I won't we won't do any spoilers um, as much as you might like to um, so to give a bit of background and feel free both of you to correct me somebody loves you is they're both is a coming of age story I would say uh, the story of Ruby who comes from an Indian family living somewhere in West London um, who doesn't talk whose mum is very ill but it also tells the story of all these people who live on the street the Parkers their friends Farah, um, and all these teachers as well. There's a sort of community of characters in the novel. Um, and Fit is also a kind of coming of age story about a girl called Rose who comes from quite extreme poverty, uh, somewhere near a moor in the north of England. Uh, she's been living in care. And again, it's also about the community of school friends and teachers that she grows up with. Um, and Okay, yeah. So 
In both, we meet children who are beginning to experience the world as adults. In both, the young children experience sexual violence. In both, state institutions such as school, prison and healthcare institutions fail to meet the needs of their communities and universities offered as a promise at the end to some, but not all. And my feeling when I was reading them and I read them really close together is that you've both written novels about class and about Britain and in a way, Mona, about India. Um, and what I had in my head the whole time was what Edward Said calls here and there. So in Somebody Loves You, we've got West London and India, and in Fit we have this northern town by a moor and a valley, but we've also got London. Um, so when I'm approaching the question of where we come from in both novels, I guess I'm not just thinking about place, Ruby's Indianness, Rose's northernness, but also of material conditions the characters are living in, their access to food, to housing, and to healthcare and education. Um, and thinking more specifically about childhood and what it represents. Um, I think it's so interesting that both novels are set right at that exciting cusp of childhood and adulthood, um, that time when everything seems possible um, and we're pulled in one direction by where we're from and another by the possibility of radical disruption or escape, whether that's by becoming a model or not speaking or going to university. Um, and in both novels, the fates of the protagonists, their ability to escape where they're from as they enter adulthood evokes and rubs against the possibility of multiple futures for their communities too. Um, and I couldn't help but feel that both your novels were asking us, like, what if we didn't live like this? What if we lived in a different world? Um, so today I want us to imagine a Britain where Ruby, Rania, Rose, Aaron and Dylan are all living together, if that makes sense. So all of these characters and these communities. And I want to get really stuck into their childhoods, their material conditions, the sex that the people around them are having and what this says about Britain and the world. And I'm incredibly excited to talk to you both about what you have written. Um, so enough talking from me, I was wondering if um, we could have start with some readings from you. Um, Sammy, maybe you'd like to go first. Yeah, sure, thank you. That's a really nice introduction as well. And you know, one of the things we were saying uh, when we were talking beforehand is it is amazing the, the, the correspondences between the books. And I love the idea of the characters sitting down together. So um, the passage I'm going to read is Rose. Uh, she goes down to London. She has an opportunity to do some work experience um, with Titch. And Titch agrees to, to put her up in her house in Chiswick. And this is Rose entering that house in Chiswick for the first time. Titch opens the door. A long corridor stretches before them. Rose forward with a sense, not of shock, but of liquid strangeness. The corridor is grand. The ceilings are high. At the far end is a mirror, and in front of the mirror, a sculpture. But on hooks on one side are coats piled high, and beneath are shoes stacked on a shelf. There are pictures on the walls, too many pictures. The floor is wood, inlaid in little diagonal tiles, with a long, shabby, patterned rug on top. She steps forward. The air is dusty and perfumed. The flat is small. Sorry it's such a tip, says Titch. The pictures are not pictures as Rose knows them. One has a few lines on a textured piece of paper. Another shows a man standing on a globe, a fierce expression of grief and horror on his face, while he tears with his teeth at a severed human leg, and crowds of goggle-eyed figures stare from the edges. Good, isn't it? says Titch, brightly. It's an 18th century political cartoon. Rose stares at the carefully rendered tendrils of meat that hang from the man's teeth. Come on in, Titch says. They step into a room. This is the drawing room, she says. Rose stares. It looks like a living room. And this is the loo, says Titch, opening the door. Rose obligingly peers into a small toilet. Kitchen, help yourself to anything, and dining room. Rose leans over Titch to look. A fitted kitchen is clogged with bottles and jars on every surface. None of it looks like food. And your room, you've got an ensuite. 
She smiles. You must be tired. I'll leave you to it. When the door closes behind Titch, Rose sits on the bed, then lies back and looks up at the ceiling. She stands, goes to the toilet attached to her room. She wonders what the ensuite is. Sitting on the toilet, she looks around. It's like a normal room in miniature. It has books in it. She picks one up. It has cartoons. She reads one. It's about people and horses. There seems no particular point to it. There are pictures on the wall. One is a pen and ink drawing of a house with a thatched roof and roses climbing the walls. It looks like Grandma's cottage in Little Red Riding Hood. She wipes herself, still staring. A curl of inky smoke swirls from the chimney. Rose doesn't normally dream, but here she does. She dreams of clean sheets, and then she wakes in them, damp, and she drifts off again. The air is dense, warm. She dreams of Aaron, beside her in the bed. He rolls and stirs, restless, and she wakes, and his legs are her legs, and she sleeps. She dreams of a long corridor and a tatty rug, and windows through which flick scenes. A lake, a house, a man chewing on a leg. The sheets bunch around her, and she knows she's hidden what needs she needs in them somewhere. She rolls and twists, and in the sheets is the place where she's hidden the trolley, the rack of chocolate, the bags of crisps. She comes to with the smack of waking after a fever, the wide, drenched suddenness of it. The sheets are wet and the mattress is exposed. She can feel the imprint of a button in the small of her back. At breakfast, Titch has muesli and yogurt, while Rose has toast and jam. Rose has orange juice, Titch has coffee. Rose watches Titch eat. She puts the spoon in her mouth delicately with a small, neat amount of yogurt and a practiced curl of the handle to make sure nothing is sloppy or spilt. She has the yoghurt first, then coffee. When she sips it, her eyes slip up over the top of the cup. Rose meets the glance and Titch looks down. Above the table is a photo of a cottage like the picture in the bathroom. Not just like, but almost identical, down to the roses, the thatch and the curl of smoke. Rose can see the clean, bright white of the walls, the black of the half-timbered frame, frames around the door and the windows. Is disorientating, as though something she imagined has been made real. She's never seen anything so pretty. Rose asks, Is that the whole house from the toilet? Titch smiles. Yes. I did a pen, pen and ink from the photo. Not very good, so I hid it away. Is it real? asks Rose. Titch is startled. What do you mean? Is it a real place? Titch smiles. That's my other house. She hesitates. In the country. Rose stares at her. Really? Titch smiles again. A different smile this time. Wide and helpless and unable to conceal her pleasure in Rose's innocence. Yes. That's that one. Um, thank you so much. That was wonderful. And that house, the, the spare house, becomes very important later in the novel. Um, okay, so let's get let's go straight to you, Mona, for your reading. Thank you. I love that 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 um, that piece, that extract, because it speaks so much of the piece. I'm going to read the extract. I'm going to read, and um, well, we can talk about why in a minute. Um, so just to say, um, uh, the protagonist. Ruby is um, in this scene she's with her sister Rania and her best friend and they've gone to a party. The party is in a huge house in the posh part of town. A maid answers the door and without a second look Rania immediately heads over to a crowd of people she knows on the train. On the train, she sweetly told me to have a nice time and no one gives a fuck about how much I'll be talking. In fact, it's probably be an asset and all that they will care about is having some exotic young Indian girls at the party. The hall is not like a normal hall, more like a long unfurnished room and there is an oversized dramatic painting taking up the space on one wall. It's all lit up from above with a tiny row of picture lamps and if you step back, you can see in the foreground three small figures. 
tall black lean men leaning on canes in somewhere like Kenya. A couple of guests are looking at it, bending and arching their bodies to get a fresh look from a distance. It's extraordinary. I mean, it's so moving in its, in, in its simplicity, says the woman. Yes, I agree, says the man. It's powered by its artlessness. Farah and I stand at the edges of the main room like overaged orphans. There's a man in a really cool suit with tapered trousers which finish short on his leg. He's sweating gently in his expensive jacket. Then there's a group of loud men with girlfriends who won't leave their sides. In our corner, there is the choice. A young, enthusiastic man with two moles either side of his face, one of which resembles a worm cast, or a man with a nice square face under a thick, uncontrollable mop of black hair with hairy wrists and hands and fingers and knuckles to accompany them all. They have names like Russell or Dominic. A Russell Dominic leans forward to talk and Farah is all of a sudden perky, upright and annoyingly attentive. Russell Dominic has a watch, the face of which looks, like, looks old and expensive with a thin bezel of gold and a leather strap which looks new. I must have been staring at the watch because Russell Dominic removes his important timepiece and gives it to me to hold. It's a kind of heirloom, he says. I turn the watch over, and lo and behold, on the back is an old inscription etched into the metal, almost faded. I am holding in my hands the oldest item I have ever held, and I wonder if that makes it a significant day. Russell Dominic has round, light brown eyes, a bit like a gentle bear's I stared into once at the zoo. We're very beautiful. You have beautiful skin, he says, after smiling at me through his glass whilst he takes a sip of orange whiskey. Thanks, I mouth very carefully, and I feel the choker tightening around my throat, beginning to strangle me. I realise that parties like this are a great place to contort my mouth into various positions where it might appear to people that I am talking and emitting words and sentences when in fact no trace of a sound comes out. I can tell Russell Dominic really needs or wants to dance. His feet are tapping furiously. My parents were very Methodist, very strict, no television, no papers or dancing because what do they say? The devil has all the best tunes. He thinks he's really funny and Farah is laughing loudly. I take a look at his thick wrists. He was no Methodist. I didn't believe a word of it. He did not, did not appear to have melancholic bones. Sometimes I do this. I imagine being stark naked in the sheets of a bed with a man. I close my eyes and let my mind follow through like a film. It's a good way of auditioning a prospective man that I may one day cross a threshold with. And then sometimes later, when I'm underneath my own bed covers, I might try with my own two bony fingers or a malleable pillow. I go into this space with Russell Dominic. I lift up my arm and comb a hand through his hair, but the hair is deep, like unkept grass, and my entire hand goes in and pushes until I haven't reached the bottom, and then I'm elbow deep in the dirty hair of a man, and I'm still not even touching the roots, and then I begin to panic, and quickly, I rescue my hand. That was wonderful, thank you, Mona. Um, so, in, in both of those scenes, I guess, we see your protagonists um, sort of plucked out of their home settings and in these sort of new posh London um, houses with the Dominic slash Russells and, and Titch. Um, and in, in both of them, neither, of, neither Ruby nor Rose speaks. And, and that's how Ruby is pretty much throughout your novel, um, Somebody Loves You, and it's how Rose often is, but not always throughout fit. So I was wondering um, how and why each of you came to make that decision. Um, and then also for the audience, because these are both books that are very sort of pro-women, feminist, you know, seeking the liberation of their characters, in my opinion. Um, so with that kind of framework, I was wondering, yeah, how you came to create these characters who, like we saw in those scenes, are largely not speaking. You go first, Mona. <laughs> okay. um, 
So, yeah, I mean, I, I think I'll speak to both those pieces maybe a little bit because I found that they they are really in conversation with each other because in some ways both of our books are about somebody who's a who's a, a young adult trying to navigate those slender veins of like early late sort of childhood you know like when you're sort of at that cusp and I think there's something about that time that when we're so oozy and sort of not set and we are we are sort of just exploring and we're you know and and there's this kind of really really interesting ephemeral quality about us when we are like that that I really find fascinating and I think that with the um with with both of our pieces the characters were already kind of othered in different ways anyway and then they're kind of othered in this kind of in these houses and actually I think that the imagination in those houses is also really interesting because where you go to the kind of banal you know the things that are in a kitchen or things that are in a hallway or a watch you know things that are kind of taken for granted these pieces these heirlooms are kind of given this different kind of weight and I find that really fascinating because actually um, I think unless you know unless you've been in those situations and you feel like on the periphery you can't know what it's like, you know, because you're you're always at the center. You can't possibly know. So I find that really interesting. And I found that really interesting in Sammy's book, too. But I think in terms of like the language and the the, um, the silence, I agree with you. I think that even my in, in my book, I feel that Ruby, Ruby does not say a word. Now, that's an act of agency. She has decided that she's not going to collude. She's looked, she's worked it out. She's uh, a savvy, um, you know, intelligent woman who has decided that she can see what the alternatives are to speaking and she's not going to collude. And and I also think that she can talk, but she's just made the, she makes a, a sort of daily decision that she's not going to. And I think really that's to do with the fact that she's, she's the, the melancholia that is, is surrounding her the whole time with the mother has also taken over so maybe she just finds that, that it's a sort of almost a refuge for her which sounds ironic and strange and paradoxical but that that's how it can be sometimes so I suppose that's it's an exploration of what happens to somebody what happens to language under pressure of mm-hmm. melancholia and feeling like you are not belonging mm-hmm. I mean I, it's really interesting hearing that description of it because I, I think we, we spoke beforehand about this. And to me, I hadn't properly clocked how little Rose spoke until Yara came up with this question. Um, and so I've been thinking about it for the last couple of days and, 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 and just formulating it in my mind. And I think the root of it is that actually the working title for this book was Hunger. And mm. it was based around the idea of fairy tales. Uh, and in particular, mm. um, you know, one of the key references is, uh, is Hansel and Gretel. And this is all around the fact that as a teacher, I've seen uh, young people who are genuinely starving. And it, it still shocks me even thinking about it, that you can have people in a country like Britain today who have not enough to eat and are reduced to stealing from bins in the case that I'm thinking of. So that extremity of deprivation was the thing that I started with. And the thing about hunger is it, it's an intensifier of everything, isn't it? You know, in a state of hunger... Um, you lose all the kind of, I mean, as teachers, we're always talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And at the top is self-actualization and all these kind of wonderful things. At the bottom, the most basic need is food and shelter. Um, And if you're not, if your basic needs are not being met, then everything else disappears. You don't have small talk. You don't have anything because your basic needs are not being met. And then on top of that, the other thing that's occurred to me thinking about this is that, um, I didn't really consciously think about it in terms of language, but I did think as I was planning it that Rose is not just starved of food, she's starved of emotional contact. Mm. And there's a line in the book which um, says that uh, touch is like a foreign language to her. And that's something which anyone who's been around kids who've experienced deprivation will recognize that actually the way they physically interact with you is very strange. And sometimes it can be, you know, the opposite of what you think. They don't kind of recoil. They'll actually kind of grab your hand in 
you know, in odd contexts and, and touch you in ways that you feel uncomfortable with because they don't understand the way we communicate through touch. And I think for Rose, that's true of touch, it's true of sex, it's true of friendship, and it's true of speech. None of them are fluent for her. That's really, that's really interesting. Um, and it's interesting, yeah, to see both, I suppose, as like, on the one hand, a rebellion and a seizing of agency, and on the other hand, just also a product of circumstance mm -hmm. um, that is outside of the control. Um, and and it, you know, that, that rebellion thing, the, I, I should say that in my, in my mind, and I think if you read the book, you know, Rose does have a moment of rebellion, but even there, she doesn't really articulate it outside. She says it in her head. But I think to me, that's the kind of that's actually the words that she's she's trying to say all through the book are the ones that come out in her head in her moment of rebellion. No, you're so right, actually. And I think both Rose and Ruby, in the end, find their ways of disrupting um, the worlds that they are in. Um, but I don't want to spoil um, the ending, but it is very exciting, that bit. Um, so I guess thinking more about um, what is said and what is unsaid and what's articulated and what's not articulated, um, I think both novels have a really interesting relationship to um, place and what location, what places you name and don't name. So in that extract, we heard Chiswick, for example, be named, um, but then the town where Rose is actually from is described in terms of the valley and the moor. And, um, and similarly, in Somebody Loves You, we aren't given very many place names. And I also feel that India and the subcontinent are constantly present in the novel, but also are not even that often really referenced or spoken about or represented. Um, so I wanted to ask you both, why did you why and how did you come to these decisions about places that you would name and places you wouldn't name and how you would talk about place um yeah shall i go first yeah. um yeah so this book um was a much longer book and it did have um i mean like it was probably seven thousand words longer and for a small book that's quite a lot of words and as i was writing it i had um I had a backstory. I had a backstory for the parents. I had um, the journey the, the, of the, the diaspora, really. And I made a decision that I I felt like it would it, it really just dominated the the book too much. And mm. I also felt that I what I wanted to do was not to actually for the reader it's really important to understand that the what I was interested in, silence, melancholia, language and the imagination and beauty as well, as long as, as long, alongside pain, those two poles that are constantly in the book that you're, you're, you're constantly tripping against. I think that I felt like I needed to, to really, and that, and that was part of like, you know, editing, but also a big edit. So that's a lot of, a lot of words. I really needed to make sure that, um, those things were dominant in the in the reader and I felt that if I was going to put the story of the of 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 the of the journey and the immigration story which actually to be honest with you is a huge part of the mother's trauma um her feeling incredibly uh destabilized by that journey uprooted um I think that it would have just changed the reading of it and so I deliberately I think made a decision that I was going to do that cull and change the, change the way that that, that story be, begun. And then actually as a story, as, as, as I started to tell the story, I just really felt like I wanted to take more and more air out of it. And so I wanted to take away those things that were obvious and clear. So anything that, that placed it directly, even in terms of um, time, you know, you can tell people don't have a mobile phone, so you can sort of set it in, you know, around the 80s and 90s. But it was a sort of deliberate decision that I made. And I think that then what happens is that the story becomes something else, which is really the, you know, the weather of the story is is the, the melancholia of the mother and that what happens to language. But I agree with you. I think that 
India is kind of the understory. You know, it's it's there, and and sometimes book touches on it. I mean, there's one little bit actually at right at the end. I mean, I might read this for you actually if it, if um, if you don't. I was actually just looking for it. I think that's <laughs> Um, because it's the only time actually that I think I've, I sort of make a decision that I was going to put it in because I thought it was important so basically those 7,000 wor words have been reduced to five lines something on the shelf of my mother's heart died when she came to England she suffered badly from chillblains the gnawing pain my father bought new shoes, but the stubborn leather pressed against the tender lumps on her toes and made her wince and cry when she walked. The doctors prescribed pills for loneliness, pills for her purple toes, insomnia pills and pills for the tick she developed on her left eyebrow, which had begun to pinch so hard she felt the water gushing out through her tear ducts. So that's it. <laughs> It's, I mean, it, it's so it's so interesting hearing that because that's stripping away. So I, I have I'm a big fan of Tintin, um, and um, listening to you talk about that reminds me. There was someone I read <laughs> reading about Tintin, and they were saying that the key thing about Tintin is that he's got nothing in his face. It's the easiest face to draw, and because you take away all the defining features of it, it becomes everyone's face. And there's something there about actually the stripping back and the taking away of detail creates a different way that you interact with the character. And I think that in, in Somebody Loves You, what you do is you, you inhabit Ruby very completely precisely because you're not actually anchored to really specific things like her voice or, or you know, you're just in her. And that's all you have is, is her experience. You, know, you don't really think about what she looks like because she's you. Um, and I think that I was trying to do something similar about the place, less about the characters, because I think my characters are seen from the outside much more. Um, and and the, there's a kind of, the, there's more of a distancing there. But the place was intended to feel like the place that you grow up in. Because the place that you grow up in, you don't think about the street names, you don't think about the um, the geography of the locations, you think about you know, the bin that you pass on your way home from school that you always put your chewing gum in. You think about the tree that you used to like to climb. You know, that's how you feel your own place. Um, and I wanted to center the book on the northern town so that it was Rose's own place. And then when she went to London, it was mm. very, very specific and detailed because it was so alien. And the detail makes it feel alien. The other thing going on there. I so said there's two other kind of aspects of which, which are related. One is that I have a, I, I'm a massive fan of a lot, and I might get myself in trouble here because this is of course Paisley Book Festival. I'm a massive fan of Scott's vernacular literature. And in fact, behind me is my Alistair Gray print. You know, I'm, I, I love this stuff. Um, my second son is even called Alistair, is his middle name. But I do find that when something is written in the vernacular, it's distancing, it's othering. So the reader reads it as something alien. So it was quite an important thing about this sense of place is that it was, it was kind of generalized, but also it was linked to this kind of idea of a non-specific voice. And it's only when Rose goes to London that suddenly someone goes, oh my God, you've got a Northern accent. And then suddenly by going somewhere else, you get that sense of the place that you've come from. So really kind of interesting mm. interplay there. But the last thing I've got to mention about place is that, of course, the biggest thing for me in creating this, this unnamed town was that I had to make sure that none of my students thought they were in the book. <laughs> if I said it in Sunderland, I might have got in trouble. So I had to, and actually the, 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 the geography of it is actually Peebles in the Scottish borders, but moved to around North Yorkshire. So um, there was quite a, 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 a cynical element of that too. Oh, well, that's very wise. And I'm glad you said that because I was thinking, oh God, my geography is terrible. I can't work out where this place is. Um, <laughs> I'm such a disrespectful southerner. I need to sort out my geography. Um, so, no, that's really, that is really interesting. And 
yeah, you only need a sort of a map with all the place names for somewhere that is is not your home, I suppose. Um, and I guess on the subject of um, of communities and places and people who aren't real and real communities, and, and also going back to what you said, Sammy, about um, your real life experience of being a teacher and seeing kids that aren't like don't have enough to eat coming into your school. I thought what was kind of really extraordinary and I really, really loved about both books is how you create these whole communities so generously. Um, we have so many different characters that I feel are written with so much care. And even when they do terrible things, they're whole humans, um, if that if that makes sense. Um, and yeah, I suppose, I suppose, you know, there's this sort of street full of characters um, that Ruby lives on and some of them are like old school white working class. Um, and similarly in this unnamed town, but particularly in the school, you know, you're very specific that you have two black girls in the friendship group. And yeah, and but also so I felt that both of you were writing these deliberately multicultural, multiracial communities with a lot of generosity, um, whilst also thinking about the material conditions, like I said before, and class. And I felt, Mona, even though you kind of didn't really say when it was, I felt like I was kind of reading about um, like the end of Thatcherism and Sammy, in your book, which is sort of like more identifiably sort of contemporary, I also felt like I was reading about, you know, the age of austerity more recently. And I was kind of wondering um, how much, how did you put these communities together and what was important to you to put across and um, why were you so generous with all your characters? And do you think you were generous? I like the idea of being generous. I'm quite <laughs> pleased with that as a description. <laughs> And I, I suppose I'd I'd say that you know the 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 kind of diversity of characters is both a conscious choice and also a um, just a very simply a reflection of the kind of mix I see in schools. Um, you know, my London schools were very you know very very diverse, but but you know with much larger number of of non-white um, students uh, in the the north in the, the areas that I teach in you tend to get a couple of kids in a year group. And I thought that was also quite an interesting um, uh, you know, narrative position because I think for Oni in particular, you know, it's in, uh, the character Alicia, to me, I haven't actually, I haven't even decided exactly what her racial background is because she represents something that's much more assimilated. But Oni is recognizably Nigerian, um, and I think that what happens to her character is a product of her outsider status, even though it's never signposted. And I think that you know, there is another strand to that, which is very simply that at the time that I was writing, I was reading a lot of stuff about um, you know grooming gangs and stuff like this, and um, uh, I just felt it was, it was really important to kind of uh, present sexuality and race together in mm. young women growing up in Britain today, because I think the two things interact um, in uncomfortable ways at times. Um, as for the kind of wider community, you know, I just, I just, it ended up because of it, it, I'll try to think how to describe this. The story, I mentioned before that the idea of fairy tale architecture behind the story, and it was set up as a kind of collision of three fairy tales, Hansel and Gretel, Cinderella and Beauty and the Beast. And um, as such, it needed multiple people to occupy multiple positions in those stories. Sometimes you're thinking it's this character, are they in this story or that? Sometimes it's different characters. So I needed a range of characters in order to do that. But once I had that, um, I had a really, really important touchstone in my mind, which was um, the crime writer, George Pelicanos, uh, who I, I remember reading a book of his a uh, number of years ago and just, you know, I was just reading it and, and there was a waitress character who was totally incidental to the plot and was drawn with such care and attention 
that she just came alive off the page. She was there for about a page and a half. And it always struck me that that, I think, is the duty a writer owes to a reader, is to fully envisage all the characters, not to kind of leave some people as ciphers on the edge, but to actually see them as somewhere off screen, having their own lives and their full life beyond. And I'd even say, I'm going to, sorry, I'll keep on thinking of more things to say, but that that sense of characters having their lives beyond the focus of the story is something that um, I, there, there's a lot of incidental stories within the story that kind of ping off in different directions and I don't follow necessarily. And one person raised that with me once where they said, you know, why is it we never learn more about X or Y? And my answer was because you don't, you just don't. In life, you don't do that. You never find these things out. You pass someone on the street and they might have all these things going on with them and you would never know. So that's a very long and rambling answer. Sorry. No, I like that. And I think it's another way that your novel is about community uh, rather than like just sort of like an isolated protagonist or their love interest, which is what so many novels are. Um, and I really like that. Um, Mona, over to you. Yeah, I like that, Sammy. I like that idea of like not things not being tidy. And um, I guess that's one of my a kind of, I think, um, real conscious effort that I made in the, in the book actually was to try to tell the truth of Ruby and and one of the the truths of living in a community of people is that they are compl complicated and you know you're living in a diverse community but actually people are racist and people are misogynistic and uh, there are huge number of issues but actually Ruby is subject to racism but she does also a really terrible thing I think it's a terrible thing and then yeah, and she has these really she thinks profoundly important deep relationships with people and then she drops them you know um, she wants desire she likes to sit with desire you know and then she doesn't want to gratify the desire you know so and that is kind of how humans are as well sometimes you don't always just um you know at the beginning of a relationship you don't necessarily you never, you know, you don't necessarily involve yourself in that relationship. So, and you discard people, and it happens. It happens. This is what happens in a, in truthfully. And I think that, I suppose, I was just trying to write the world in a, in a truthful way that, and also experience it in the way that Ruby experienced it. And I, I guess with, with Ruby, because she's, I feel with Ruby, I, I, I just really followed her voice. You know, I, I really, I keep saying this to everyone, but I really literally tricked myself into writing this book. I got into her voice and often I wanted the, the, the book to go in a particular direction, but that's not what what Ruby wanted. And sometimes the 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 novel is knows better than the novel itself and the the characters know better than the than the writer, uh, than the author. And so I had to go along with, you know, that. And I wanted her to talk at, at one point, actually, consciously as the author. But she never talked. She never wanted to. She never wanted to utter anything. So I suppose those room full of people, that room, that room of like um, other characters, I think that are some of those people are are important, and some some of those things are not tied up. And being untidy, not tying things up, is actually how life is. And I actually have to say, when I read books and which are which you know are plot driven and you know not listen this is me my personal view and I think because I'm a poet I feel this very very strongly I feel that you know things are oozy and untidy and uncertain and that ha is how life is that is how our lives are and so if you're going to reflect that truth in literature and in in, in a novel I think you have to be able to do that in and in, in the form you know that that's available to you um, I like that word oozy. Um, I think, I guess this is what I'm sort of driving at and I can't go all the way of my questions like I'd like to because they would contain terrible spoilers for the audience. Um, but both of these novels have these amazing climaxes um, that revolve around sort of bad things happening and retaliation and 
without going too much into it, I think what's amazing is um, how you can get your characters to do these sort of terrible things. And as a reader, um, we're not alienated or we kind of understand, even as, even as perhaps we are horrified. And I think that that's sort of the mark of a really good writing and really like, um, like effective world building in a way. So I love that. And you should all get these books and read them right to the end. Um, so we've got sort of just over 10 minutes left and I wanted to see if there were any questions from anyone listening. Um, okay, wonderful. We've got one here um, for Mona. What made you turn from poetry to prose for this novel? Was the process different for you and did anything about writing it surprise you? Yeah, it's such a good question because um, I, I feel like this is a, a, a book, a, a novel that has um, a kind of real poetic spirit and it's a, poet, a poetry driven novel, you know, as opposed to a plot driven novel. That's how I see the, how, how I see the, the, the novel. I mean, I didn't plot it at all and I, I literally um, let Ruby out. I mean, Ruby. Ruby's Ruby basically was this this character in my head. She was sort of has been sort of in my head for a, a, a while. And then after I finished writing my first book, my of poems, I had this um, I had a period of sort of writer's block, I suppose you'd call it. And I just had this had this uh, like tapping noise in my head. Who was Ruby? And I I basically committed to writing her. But the difference, I suppose, with being writing prose and poetry because now I do both is the fact that I feel that with poems they come from a totally different space they come from a kind of the peripheral space and it's almost like your the peripheral vision you know poems are happening in that other space all all the while without you really thinking about it and I think with the novel I actually had to sit down and commit myself to writing um the, the novel and and her and sort of putting on my cardigan my ruby cardigan which is the back of my chair and it's disgusting but you know I'd sit down and I'd, I'd I'd literally write it and it's not the one was as more difficult than the other it was very very different but I knew that I was I felt like I was in different spaces when I was in when I was on it's almost as if poems flourish in the inattentive space mm. and, um the novel seems to need a bit, needs a little bit more front lobe attention. If that makes sense at all. <laughs> that makes total sense to me. It's very, very annoying the sort of <laughs> concentration that putting together a novel uh, requires. Um, and what I love about Somebody Loves You though is that when those plot, quote unquote, plot moments happen, they are so driven by the form. Yeah, and the form embodies what's happening, and I think that that's I love it when I encounter that in in novels. Um, so I, I mean, I just, got, I just, we've I just got to you as well, but you go ahead because I think yeah. it's quite interesting. All I was going to say was, I mean, I, I say this as someone who is absolutely obsessed with poetry. I love poetry to bits, but at the same time, I was really interested. I approached this this book, Somebody Loves You, expecting, as you say, a poetic book, and I read the first because you know, I, I think I'd, I'd, I'd seen the first section before and I read the first couple of sections. And then I was really interested to see how it became very, very narrative. Like it, it starts in quite a poetic way. And there mm -hmm. is, you know, you, I see what you mean about it being written on a poetic construction, but it, it isn't oppressively poetic, if you know what I mean. Like, <laughs> not that I would find it oppressive, but, you know, sometimes books can be very, very self-conscious about that poetic quality. But I think it has the quality of really good blank verse in the sense that it just reads like, like thought. Has he's frozen for me as well? Um, I have a question. Okay, I've got a question just for Sammy, but I'll save that till he's unfrozen. Um, so a question for both of you. Um, is any factor more or less important place, voice, income bracket, voice or accent I've been interested in how we slam lots of things together sometimes to try and define our class quote unquote 
in the UK. Sorry about that. Sorry, Maybe. Sammy, should I, should I just yeah. repeat the question? Yeah. Yes. Um, so this is a question for both of you. Then I've got a question just for you, and then I'm going to see how much time we have left. So a question for both of you. I guess it's about class and identity. Um, is any factor more or less important to you, place, voice or accent, income bracket? I've always been interested in how we slam lots of things together sometimes to try and define our class in the UK. That's from Esther. Is, um, is, is Sammy frozen again? He is for me. Why don't you go ahead and answer that and hopefully Sammy will come back in. Yeah, I mean, it's a really difficult question to answer. And I think that, I think a lot of those things together actually mesh together. I think there's no one thing really. Um, I, I feel as if there's also another thing that comes into place if you are from a migrant background as well because then you have you are sort of you're in this other class as well um and I think that that dominates sometimes it certainly did when I was growing up you know in the 1980s under Thatcherism um you know quite a difficult time to live and go to school and and I think that you know you you feel as if like that is kind of the dominating factor and a lot of there were a lot of poor people that were here that arrived you know in those in those times in the 1950s and 60s so I think that all of those things mesh together but I do think that code switching is something that I've become really interested in because it's incredible how quickly you can jump into different contexts and I see that a lot I see that with a lot of a lot of young young people in it and it's it's interesting to me how you can switch from from your accent to a different kind of sort of a persona. Um, when I was a lawyer, I saw that a lot. I saw people that were from working class backgrounds who'd made it as barristers, for example, and were able to do that switch. And I, it fascinated me how you would have to then sort of take on this other persona on, and become this other person. Yeah, totally. It makes me think about um, Stuart Hall, who said that race was the modality through which we experience class, I think. Um, Sammy, did you catch that question? And do you want to... Um... Yeah, no, I'm afraid I didn't get the question. Sorry. Okay. Well, it's, it's, in the, it's, in, it's in the chat, but I'll read it again. Is any factor more or less important, place, voice and accent, income bracket? I've always been interested in how we slam lots of things together to try and define our class, quote unquote, in the UK from Esther. I mean, I, this is the thing. So my my work on the Social Mobility Commission um, was very much around looking at class and place and stuff like that. And, and the conclusion that I would come to, I mean, look, there, there's two ways. There's thinking about it as a writer where you're trying to explore the kind of nuances and the gaps and so on. But it, when you look at policy and the construction of society in, in Britain today, the uncomfortable truth is that we are a total mess, um, that we are hamstrung by a sense of what class is that seems culturally hardwired, but it doesn't have much relationship to what's actually going on on the ground. Um, and, you know, sociologists point to a, a kind of seven part categorization of class, um, which is all around uh, you know, different kinds of capital and stuff like this. It's too complicated for people to use on a daily basis. So really, when you ask people what class are they, you're asking them a question about how they see themselves rather than how others see them necessarily. Um, and I think that's what makes it so, so difficult to navigate because we have this, this problem whereby, you know, 30, 35 percent of the country are sociologically categorized as working class, but 60 percent of the country think they're working class. <laughs> that's really interesting and in my head I was just thinking like well do they own the means of production because um, exactly, exactly. Um, in which case Marx doesn't make much <laughs> <laughs> um, okay I've got a question for you Sammy um, how how does writing change your perspective as a teacher and or how does being a teacher change your perspective as a writer um, that's a great question I, I think that um they have very much been hand in hand for me. Uh, and um, 
I think the process of writing about the topics that I have been writing about has been really helpful for me as a teacher because it's forced me to articulate and identify some of the feelings that I see in the young people that I teach. So it's very easy if you're kind of in the the cut and thrust of a lesson to kind of gloss over the things that you're seeing. But when you're forced to sit and reflect, you know, the writing becomes an act of reflection and that then can be really, really powerful when you go back and talk to the kids again. As for how it's then operated back uh, in the other direction, I think that, um, I don't even know which direction I said first, <laughs> but either way, the, uh, the thing I do find is that I'm much more comfortable as a writer talking about teaching than I am as a teacher talking about writing because that the latter ends up me standing on the yard doing break duty and a kid comes up and says, so have you written a book? And I go, yes. And then they go, what's it about? And I go, uh, <laughs> can we talk about something else? <laughs> and I, every now and then I try and read a bit in a class and I just, I, I find it horrendously embarrassing and I can't manage it. Um, well, I am intrigued about if your students have read the book and if they ever tell you what they think or if they're ever like, oh, I can't believe Mr. Wright wrote a scene where two kids give each other a hand job. That's, you know, I, 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 I know, I know. Uh, that's why lots of people say to me, oh, oh, you should do something with the kids. Fair. It's all about teenagers. And I, I kind of just think, you know, I wrote it wanting teenagers to read it, just not ones that I'm teaching. Yeah. <laughs> um. That's really interesting. So we're, I'm, I've got to say a few things before we close, but I'm going to try and cram in another question, um, which is for both of you, what are you working on next? And are we, are your characters ever going to return? Um, yeah. Um, so I'm working on a third collection of poetry because poetry is calling. Um, and it's, it, I really feel as if you can't conjure poems, but when they knock at your door, they will go away if you don't open the door. <laughs> so I feel like I need to, I need to do that. I need to, I need to attend to those, um, those poems. And I don't know about, I mean, Ruby, Ruby's a strange one. She'll, she'll make her own, her, her own way in life now. And hopefully she'll have a, have a good life and maybe talk one day, but that's up to her. Really exciting. I can't wait. Um, I am, I have a, right, I'm going to just put it out there. I'm going to open myself up to, to ridicule in name checking two of the greatest writers ever to grace the literary canon. And I have a huge uh, obsession with both Emile Zola and George Eliot. I'm not saying I'm like them, but George Eliot created Middlemarch as an emblematic place to put all her ideas about Britain into. And that was in the back of my mind when I created this town. So I have already written a second novel, which oh. partly takes place in that town. Very cool. Um, and there is some overlap of some characters, of the minor characters. And then the second thing is, uh, so Emile Zola's project of the Rouge en Macar sequence, where he spends 17 novels exploring the way society develops through, through a family. That's also something I've got, you know, if I was to kind of choose my my fantasy of what I do on a desert island is I'd write my own Rouge on my car sequence. So I have a vision that all the books that I write will be linked in some sense to that town and perhaps we'll have some characters that inter uh, that cross over. Oh, that's wonderful. So we'll see the impossible purple of the moors again. Yeah. Although I, you know, that's the first time I've ever publicly stated this. Well, like a, <laughs> you have to do it now. Said it now, it's too late. Like, you said it, so yeah, yeah. it's going to live on Paisley Book Book Festival's YouTube forever. So, yeah. um, so I have to wrap up now. Um, I'm really sad to finish this conversation. I think we could have gone on for much longer. Um, yes. So everyone, please do go to um, bookshop.org where you can buy Fit and Somebody Loves You. Um, and bookshop.org is very cool because um, the money, you're buying it online, but you're buying it from um, indie bookshops. So it's like the most ethical, wonderful way to buy books apart from going straight to the shops so, and they deliver to you and all of that. Um, so please, please do that before you close your browsers. 
Um, and if you can, uh, then the festival would really appreciate it if you could donate. And you can do that by going to paisleybookfest.com forward slash support. Um, and um, you can follow them online at, at, at Book Paisley on Twitter, at Book Paisley Bookfest on Instagram. And the hashtag is PBF2022. Um, and it would be wonderful if you could uh, post and say something about how much you enjoyed it and bigging up these two writers and their wonderful books. Um, and there are some other links. There's an evaluation form for you in the chat. And yeah, check out the other events. They're happening online and in person. And there are some really amazing ones. Um, and I think lastly, really big thank you to Nicola Smalley and other stories for sending us these two wonderful writers um, whose books are so complementary together. Um, I think that's it. Um, yeah, you should just keep your eye out for all of this upcoming work that we've heard about that sounds so amazing. And thank you to you both um, for this lovely conversation. I'm really grateful for your time and for your amazing writing. Thank you. Thank you.